Hi, my name is Lolly Cardozo. I'm 26 years old and I'm going to tell you a bit about what it has been like to grow up in a large family with free drugs ataxia and what I have done with my life. I discovered I got ataxia when I was 10 years old. Um, it's degenerative so it gets worse but when I was seven my parents found out there was something wrong with me and they took me to a doctor but the doctor couldn't because I was really clumsy I kept walking into things and falling off chairs and things like that. I remember walking into a lamppost once um, and the doctor who my mum took me to couldn't find what was wrong with me so we just thought I was clumsy and then when I was 10 years old I, had, I developed scoliosis and um, the, the muscles weren't supporting my spine so it was becoming curved uh, which is very common in taxia and my uncle who's a doctor knew this and he told my parents to test me for Friedrich's ataxia. And that's when I found out I had it. I can't walk or stand. I can stand holding on to things. I have no control of my legs, or almost no control. Uh, I have bladder incontinence, which is a real pain. And I have male coordination with my upper limbs. So I struggle to balance, even just sitting up, I need a backrest. And sometimes I even fall off from side to side. Um, I get dizziness due to anemia, which is very common in ataxia. And I have daily falls. It also causes frequent fatigue. I didn't suffer from fatigue that I noticed until I became pregnant when I was 20. And at 26, I found myself permanently tired. And I need to sleep every day or else by 8 o'clock in the evening I'm too grumpy to tolerate. One person in every 50,000 has the tax here and I have it which is pretty unlucky. But it's even more unlucky that two out of my five brothers and sisters also have it. I was in a wheelchair from when I was 20 years old and although Friedrich's ataxia is similar it's also different for nearly everyone who has it. My younger brother was already in a wheelchair by the age of 17 and my older brother refused a wheelchair until he was 24. I went to a prep school in Dorset called Hamford where there were more horses at the school than girls in my year. The ethos of the school was very outgoing and outdoorsy. I loved my time at Hamford. Despite always falling over and being known as the clumsy one, I fitted in very well. Leaving prep school at 13, I had my spinal operation, which was for to help hold my scoliosis. This was a big step in the physical development of my condition. At that point onwards, I was unable to run and I stopped all physical activity except riding. I went to secondary school and made amazing friends. They helped me through everything but when I was 16, I began to use the walking frame and things began to take more of a mental toll on me. But my friends helped, to help me to keep positive. Falling over and off things was always funny and my walking frame was called all sorts of weird names and friends would often see how fast they could push me down the corridors at school on my, on my walking frame. Most people may not consider Feeling indebted to people that helped me put a lot of strain on me mentally. This developed into fear of asking too much of people, and I had to tackle with depression and anxiety. However, something which helped me to feel less guilty was when my friends got special treatment because they assisted me. My parents never wanted to talk about the emotional consequences of my disability and would dismiss indulging in negativity. Despite that, my whole family are amazing regarding my physical limits. We were never held back and the attitude in my family was, you can do anything. I came out of school with two C's, which is all I needed to get into Bournemouth Art University to do an art foundation. 
and art is something that I discovered I loved, partly because I was unaffected by, by, by my ability to walk. I started out my fine foundation course doing fine art, I ended up going to in a different direction to specialise in film. However, I continued doing my own paintings and have since done five exhibitions which were all successful and I raised over £2,000 each for each of them and they were all exhibitions for charities. They have a close place to my heart as a result from my adventures after university. After Bournemouth University, I went interrailing through Europe with some friends from Mexico and later that year I sailed across the Atlantic on a tour trip with a crew of 40. I went with the Jubilee Sailing Trust, which is a charity that funds different sailing adventures for able people and disabled people. After coming home for two weeks, I flew to Zambia and spent six weeks with some cousins of my school friend. They had a beautiful, luxurious house. The driver that they had took me to a school every day so that I could teach for the mornings. Then the driver would take me to the, to the stables me every afternoon so that I could go riding. I can't do much but sit on a horse so that it generally plods along. It feels very good for me as, as I have to use my balance and um, the way a ho horse moves underneath you is a bit like the way that someone's hips should move when they walk. So after staying with those friends I lived at an orphanage and I had an even better time there. I was so happy, happy and satisfyingly tired at the end of each day of teaching at the orphanage and at the Hill Project School. All the mental struggles linked my disability vanished and I fell in love with a Zambian man. And it was tragic when I left. I cried and cried and cried. I went travelling in India with my young brother's best friend, Harry. He looked after me so well in India. We put the cheapest hotels, so they had uh, lots of stairs and no lifts. And Harry would just carry me up, or carry me everywhere, even into the sea when I when I wanted to go for a swim. When we took a tuk tuk, he would dismantle my whole mobility schedule, come and have a story call it. And uh, and he, after putting me in, he put that in in parts. After getting back to England for two weeks. I returned to Zambia, wanting to pursue a career in teaching at the Genie's Hill Project. But that was when I fell pregnant. Choo Choo, the father, now my husband, was not permitted a visa and could not be present at the birth of our daughter, Calypso. A week after I arrived in Zambia in 2016, before I fell pregnant, the cultural differences that surfaced was the root of a lot of frustration for me. Nonetheless, I think I have overcome most of these frustrations. I have fought through the battles of culture difference, language barriers, and barriers that a taxi has made for me. And I have come out of the come out the other side of this and and have got married and we're very happy. We've bought a property where we intend to accommodate children in need and we will be giving workshops like carpentry, music, art, gardening, building, mechanics. This hopefully will help them pursue a career that they don't necessarily have to have had a good or full or proper education for. And we also hope to get youths off the street and give them some food, fun and education. I have my lows and days, especially when I keep falling over, but overall, a taxi doesn't have to limit me and it doesn't have to limit anyone. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. Just surround yourself with people who you love and people who love you. If you want any more information about the teaching I do out in Zambia or my life out in Zambia, I have lots of information you can always email me or 
send me a message on Facebook.